131. The Sabbath as a Principle of Life In analysing the Sabbath as a principle of life, it is important to remember the fact that church history is a development in awareness. This can be seen first by answering the question, were Christians previously aware of the implications of the Sabbath as a principle of life? The answer is both yes and no. To understand what such an answer means, it is helpful to turn our attention to another aspect of Scripture, the doctrine of infallibility and inerrancy. Not until the Westminster Standards do we have a clear statement of this doctrine, and only in this century have its implications come to the forefront. Does this mean that for 16 centuries the Church and its theologians did not believe in this doctrine? Clearly they did, but since infallibility was not directly under attack, they did not develop its implications. It has been the modern era which has forced the Church to think through this doctrine and to develop it. Previously it was taken for granted. The same has been true of the Sabbath. Men took for granted the necessity for short-term debts, a contentment in God's providence, and more. Relatively little attention was given to the doctrine because the laws of the Sabbath and its practice generally prevailed. Our era is compelling us to give a deeper attention to the Sabbath and to biblical law generally. Second, Men in every age seek to practice a minimal religion, and hence there is generally an unwillingness to develop the implications of doctrines. Such people are content to call themselves believers, and boast of their holiness to the faithful, whom they regard as less holy, while being offensive to God, because they are ready to compromise with paganism and call it faith. Isaiah chapter 65 Verses 1 to 5. Every age has such a vein of antinomianism, and ours especially. Thus, the understanding of the Sabbath as a principle of life has been latent and implicit in the past rather than explicit and developed. The key to an understanding of this meaning of the Sabbath is in Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 10 to 12 verses 18 to 22, although the whole chapter is relevant. Wherefore, I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness, and I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which, if a man do, he shall even live in them. Moreover, also, I gave them my Sabbaths, to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifieth them. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God, walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Notwithstanding the children rebelled against me, they walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which, if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew mine hand, and wrought for my namesake, that it should not be polluted in the sight of the heathen, in whose sight I brought them forth. Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 10 to 12, verses 18 to 22. First, it should be noted that God says he gave them my Sabbaths after the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. The Sabbath is a covenant and national fact. It requires personal and social obedience and observance. 
Ellison's comment here is very good. In spite of strong arguments to the contrary, it seems conclusive from this chapter and Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 14 that the Sabbath is part of the Sinai revelation and does not date from Eden. Certainly all efforts to find traces of a weekly rest day elsewhere in the ancient world are conspicuously failed. It is easy enough to keep the Sabbath in a legalistic way, but once it is correctly understood, it becomes a very real test of a man's faith. Only where the Lord is recognised as controller over the great powers of nature can one go beyond a legalistic cessation of work and turn heart and mind away from all the clamant claims of the world. Second, Ezekiel makes clear that the law is given to the covenant people. It speaks to the faithful, and it is declared to be the way of life for the faithful, the means of sanctification, which, if a man do, he shall even live in them. Third, the Sabbath is declared to be a sign. Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 12 and 20, simply echo Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 and 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you through your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Here we come to the heart of the matter. We cannot understand this Sabbath unless we see it as a sign. Signs are basic to Scripture, and two of the central signs are the rainbow and circumcision. A sign is used throughout the Bible of any symbol or token, but more especially of such as mark the relation of man to God and the providential care which God lavishes upon men. The rainbow, Genesis chapter 9 verse 12, marks God's miraculous deliverance of his own in a time of judgments. The same is true of the plagues of Egypt, Exodus chapter 10 verse 2. As signs, they meant grace and deliverance to the covenant people and death and judgment to the ungodly. Circumcision, Genesis chapter 17 verse 11, Romans chapter 4 verse 11, and baptism are signs of God's covenant and his grace, mercy and providential care. But a sign despised means judgment. The prophets made their predictions often as signs. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, chapter 38 verse 7, Jeremiah chapter 44 verse 29, Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 8. John speaks of Christ's miracles as signs. John chapter 3 verse 2, chapter 4 verse 54, etc. The apostolic miracles were signs. Mark chapter 16 verse 20, Acts chapter 4 verse 16, chapter 6 verse 8, chapter 8 verse 6 and verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, etc. The supreme sign, however, is the Sabbath. It's the mark of faith and of judgment. We either rest in the Lord or we are restless and without peace. It is both a personal and a social sign. We can observe a weekly Sabbath and have no rest. We can be fretful, easily annoyed and readily complaining because we seek our rest apart from the Lord. We can seek it in the society of men or in isolation from men, but in either case we have no Sabbath. We remain restless and fretful. The true Sabbath means a trust in God's providential care so that we take hands off our lives and commit them into his care. James chapter 5 verse 8 requires us to be patient and to fortify our hearts. A few of the very many texts calling for such a faith are these. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 Verses 4 to 7. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Psalm 55, verse 22. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. Therefore, I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John chapter 14, verse 27. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 Many, many more such verses can be cited. They abound from one end of the Bible to the other. These texts tell us what the Sabbath is about. It is a law, but more, it is a principle of life. It means first, resting in the Lord outwardly, knowing that it is not our work which accomplishes God's purpose and ours, but his sovereign decree. His work is a finished and perfect work, and we rest in the glory of his perfect plan. We manifest our faith by keeping his Sabbaths in all their fullness, and this includes the laws concerning debt. Second, The outward observance is meaningless if we are inwardly restless and fretful with God. We cannot plead that our disposition makes us so. God requires us to be content and in everything to give thanks. What we call our disposition or our weariness is simply a form of rebellion and it is sin. The psychological distresses of our age are manifestations of unbelief, or at least a distrust of God. They mean that we resent God's plan and demand that our own plan prevail. No Sabbath is possible for modern man. Having taken the government of all things on his shoulders, modern man can never rest. Everything always depends on him, and he can never vacate his worrisome throne for even a moment. The psalmist declares of the Lord, My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Psalm 121 verses 2 to 4. It is an attribute of God that he never sleeps, and all men who play at being a God will be fretful and discontented by day and sleepless by night. Their answer is not better circumstances, but faith. To be thankless and discontented is to indict God and to distrust his government. It means inviting either his judgment or even greater burdens until we learn to be trustful and contented. 
Our Lord in Matthew chapter 6, verse 23, does not counsel heedlessness. What he requires is that, having obeyed and served our Lord faithfully and in obedience to his law, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, chapter 5, verses 17 to 20, we are to take no thought for our lives because we are his own and he cares for us. To be content without the law is to be content with evil. We can never care for ourselves with the wisdom and the omnipotence which marks the triune God, and hence to nurse our cares or indulge our disposition is a sign of rebellion and unbelief. We must believe, obey, and rest in the Lord. It should be apparent now what the Sabbath as a sign means. It is a principle of life. More than the rainbow, circumcision and baptism, it is a sign of God's covenant grace. Its observance is both inward and outward. The Pharisees were strong Sabbatarians outwardly, but unbelievers inwardly, and they have many followers today. To be restless, fretful and sleepless is to deny the Lord and the meaning of his Sabbath. David stated the matter very clearly. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. Psalm 4, verse 8. 